We have titled this study, Our Blessed Hope. Uh, Titus 2.13 says, Looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul defines the rapture as our hope. In fact, every time hope is mentioned in the New Testament, it's in reference to this moment that we are eagerly awaiting. Just as faith needs an object, which is Christ, hope also needs an object, which in this case is our own bodily resurrection. So if somebody says, I have faith, we should ask them, faith in what? Um, Without an object, uh, faith is is meaningless. So the same goes for hope. Um, If we don't place our hope in something, then we're hopeless. Having confidence in our hope through faith, faith is what produces endurance. To live is Christ, to to die is gain. So whether we live or die, our hope is in Christ's promise to be with him eternally without sin. Um, In order to be without sin... We need sinless bodies, which is the ultimate purpose for our own resurrection. Um, Over the last few years, this promise of hope that scripture brings has been heavily attacked from within the church body. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Um, And what is he coming to steal? Your car? No. He wants to steal your hope. He wants you to be hopeless, which leads to doubt in your faith. Most of the controversy regarding the sound biblical doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church is related to the timing of these events. Uh, so during this study, we're going we're gonna to try to examine these differences um, and the proper scripture interpretation related to these views, and we'll try our best to answer any questions along the way. And then one more thing before we begin, um, I'm just astonished at uh, how little interest there is from the modern-day Christians on the subject of the rapture. Many don't even know what the rapture is. Um, And with all the signs today of um, the end of this age that's rapidly approaching, uh, the topic should be taught from every pulpit every week. Um, The Apostle Paul, he taught the church in Thessalonica after only being with them for two weeks. Um, He taught them uh, about the rapture. And uh, the very first letter that Paul wrote um, to the Thessalonians, um, it has the biggest principal description of the rapture in the whole Bible. And uh, I'm sure everywhere that he ministered, um, he brought this same message of hope. Um, So how else could we live without fear, knowing where things are headed? So Jesus is coming very soon, and uh, we need to be ready. So let's open in prayer. Okay. Lord, again, we just, um, we thank you for your son that you sent to do what we could not do. We thank you that you left us your living word to train us, teach us, guide us, and give us the hope we need to endure all that this world has to offer and the promises that are to come that no matter what happens we know where we're going to go and who we're going to be with and we know that's all because of your grace upon our lives so just be with us today as we share in your word and uh yeah teach us something new today lord in jesus name amen Amen. so only thing i'm going to add first off my name is ken if you don't know and for the thousands watching online where's the ken (laughs) you know uh this is what came to my heart about this two things One is, I think, what God has done in Kelly and I's heart is we live in interesting times, and like you mentioned, a lot of people don't know about rapture. A lot of people don't even know about what's happening in the world today. And um, this is a person, Ezekiel, that talks about being watchmen on the wall. And, you know, we don't believe if you don't know about the rapture, it doesn't mean you don't have salvation. But the Bible talks about, we talked about this in our last series that we did, that there are rewards for Christians who are faithful in this life that you get in eternity. So if a Christian is distracted or doesn't realize things are going on, they're still going to go to heaven. They're just going to miss out on some things that God has planned for them, crowns and you know things for eternity. So that's kind of our heart is, you know what, we want not just to just be teaching that because it's doctrine, that it would stir your hearts to tell your friends, to tell their friends, that the church would wake up to the times we live in so we could fulfill all that God has called us to. And in Matthew 24, the famous uh, Olivet Discourse, we always read about all the pre-signs and the, the signs, but the first thing that Jesus says after the disciples say, tell us about when all these things are going to take place, and actually it's a three-part question, he says, don't be deceived. So the enemy wants to see believers from fulfilling what God has called us to do. So that would be our heart for this. So I think you guys are going to be excited. This is pretty cool. I'm, I'm uh, pumped just about doing it. So you're up to bat. So um, we've broken down this this teaching into uh, three weeks. So um, 
the first week we're, we're going to show the case for the rapture and, and why it's needed. The second week we're going to go through um, how do we know we're getting close to this event happening. And, um, and then the third week um, we're also going to go through more of like when the timing of this event uh, actually happens and what scripture says about that. And then we're also going to go through the different viewpoints of the rapture. Uh, so um, today uh, we're going to cover the four P's. Uh, participants, promise, purpose, and process. So scripture uses a Jewish wedding tradition to paint a beautiful picture of our relationship to Christ. So if it's a wedding, let's take a look at the first P, the participants. Who is the bride? The bride of Christ. Um, Ephesians 5, 22 to 32. Um, the, these verses are out of the NASB, 1995. Um, so here we go. Paul writes, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as church, or as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father, and mother shall, leave, shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. So I'm not going to spend time going into a teaching about marital roles, but we are going to use this passage to see how Paul compares uh, marriage as an example of Christ's relationship to us. But, so, but we could. We could talk about the beginning where it says, wives be subject to your husbands. <laughs> Just kidding. There's actually more commandments for the husbands. <laughs> no, I just want the first slide. Did you notice that was only in the first slide? Um, so here Paul's, Paul's referencing um, uh, marital roles, but um, one thing to look at is what Christ, um, or what the husband's role is uh, to, um, to the wife, and that's also to uh, mimic what Christ's role is, a, a picture of what Christ's role is to the church for the bride of Christ. So this is a clear example of, of um, uh, Paul, through the Holy Spirit, writing that um, the body of Christ, the church, um, is the bride of Christ. And he even mentions, um, he's speaking with reference to Christ and the church, all these roles and how they work. And so Revelation um, 19, 7 and 8 uh, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Um, so um, here's John um, calling, calling us his bride. This is at the moment when Christ is returning at the uh, end of the tribulation, and we're with him. And, um, and so part of the study is how are we going to be get to be with him for this return. Um, and we're the bride. And um, the fine linen is uh, wearing fine linen earlier in Revelation in the um, seven letters, seven churches. Um, it explains what uh, white garments and fine linen is. It's, it defines our righteousness. And um, it lets us know that um, we are in Christ if we're clothed in these um, white garments. And so if it wasn't um, clear already who the groom is, uh, Matthew uh, 9, 14 and 15, um, he writes, Then when the disciples of John, then the disciples of John came to him asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? 
But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So Jesus is speaking. Um, John the Baptist, disciples of John the Baptist came uh, to Jesus, and um, they were, had the same questions of the Pharisees. Um, and asking why do uh, why do the disciples of Jesus not fast? And um, there's no reason to fast when the bridegroom, when the groom is with the disciples, because it's a celebration. It's a time for celebration. Um, but then Jesus says that there will be a time when the bridegroom is taken away from them, meaning um, when he uh, his death on the cross, um, and then they will they will fast. But this is Jesus himself calling himself the bridegroom. So now we know the players, the church, um, which is everybody. The church is defined as anyone that receives the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, uh, to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, um, that happened on the day of Pentecost. So anyone from the day of Pentecost until the fullness of the Gentiles, which we'll discuss, um, I think, in the third week, um, that is the Bride of Christ. It's, a, it's an exclusive group, and it's... Uh, the members of the Bride of Christ have been um, growing for the last 2,000 years, and um, and so those are the those are the main players, the participants. And so, if we have a bride and a groom, when's the wedding? All right, what is next? And we, we kind of talked about this in the, in the last study. Is that there is a difference in the Scripture between the church and the nation of Israel? But the church is made up of Jews and Gentiles. But the end times, the last seven years, the the wrath of God comes on the earth, that's when the focus goes away from the church and goes to Israel as a nation. So that's a big distinction about everything we're going to talk about here, is this is all focused on the church itself. Okay, so let's look at, when is the wedding? Whoop, sorry, I'm a little slow there. Mm-hmm. All right, so we talked about this last time, we've got the DVD. This is a great movie, if you haven't got it already, I think you can get it on uh, eBay for nine ninety nine. And this is just a movie made about the Jewish wedding, but in particular, a Galilean Jewish wedding. And in it, you see a picture of not just the rapture, but the picture of the timing of the rapture. J.D. Farag said in about the movie, he was in the movie, it's called uh, Before the Wrath. He said this, it's an amazing picture of the pre-tribulation rapture. It answers the often asked question of whether or not Jesus ever taught a pre-tribulation rapture. And thankfully, not only did did Jesus teach this, the Gospels um, repeat with Jesus speaking as a bridegroom bridegroom to his bride. So at the time that it was written, at the time that Jesus spoke, the people that were living, especially in Galilee, they knew what was happening, that the Jewish wedding in Galilee was a little bit different than it was in the rest of Israel. And so Jesus was a Galilean, right? Even though he was born in Bethlehem, he was raised in Nazareth, and all the disciples were Galileans. So they all grew up knowing what a Jewish wedding is and the celebration of it and its focus. So when he used these illusions, using that as the guide, they were clicking on all cylinders, knowing about what's happening. Oh, that's what he means. That's what he means. You know, kind of like, uh, remember when he does the, the sower of the seed? So if you're a farmer and you tell the story about Sowing, throw, sowing seed into the ground, all the farmers would relate to what he's saying. So for us, it's a little bit different. We have to do a little bit more digging. But um, this movie, I'll tell you, and even uh, I, somebody had a John Markell, she had, she had that guy on there, and he was talking about how people were going that did not know Jesus, and they were getting saved by this. It was pretty cool. So, so basically, the, the, uh, the Galilean wedding is a typology. So we're going to take a quick look, and some of this is review, and you have, I think, six points in your outline, and I'm, I'm uh, going to add a little bit to it from J.D. Farag and, and his teaching on it, which is really good. But um, here we go. So in a Jewish wedding, the father selects the bride, and we just established that that's the church, for the groom, of course, that's Jesus, and a servant, the Holy Spirit, betroths the bride to the groom. In the Jewish wedding, it's a marriage covenant called a ketubah, it was made in writing for the bride as a promise to the bride that it would be fulfilled. With our wedding, it's a new covenant. So we're going to do the contrast, right, between the Jewish wedding and our relationship with Jesus. It's a new covenant. It's made in writing. Um, it's written in the word of God for us as the bride and the old covenant promise is fulfilled. And obviously, I'm not giving you the verses, but they're, they're up there. You can write them down. And there's actually more in your syllabus. 
In the Jewish wedding, once this covenant was made, they would break bread and drink from the cup to seal the betrothal of the new covenant. Does that ring any bells? In our wedding, Jesus breaks bread and drinks from the cup at the Last Supper with the disciples, sealing his new covenant in his blood. That was all about the bridegroom and the bride and the promise of his wedding that was coming, that uh, the whole Last Supper was all about that. Of course, that's in Luke. Slide up a little here. In the Jewish wedding, the groom pays the price, showing the bride his love for her. In our wedding, Jesus paid the price on the cross in full. Am I on there? Am I off? Mm -hmm. I wasn't really looking at that. I was reading here. Sorry. Okay. Must be clicking the wrong button. Um, in our wedding, Jesus paid the price on the cross in full. This shows us how I read that. I'm sorry. Okay. So in the Jewish wedding, the groom prepares a place for his bride, the church, at his father's house to consummate the marriage. The groom says to the bride, Groom says to his bride, "Soon, I'm gonna, um, I'm going out, but I'm gonna come back. I'm preparing a place, a bridal chamber, and a, which is a room on addition of the father's house. Back one of our trips to Israel, we went up to Chorazon, which is one of the three Galilean cities that was woed by Jesus himself, and it's a ruin now. And you see the partial buildings, and you can see like here's the main house, and here's where the son built the house on the back of it for his family." And on that one, another one was built, and on another, right? It was how they lived their communal life. But anyway, so Jesus says, well, I'm going to come back for you. I'm leaving, but I'm coming back, and uh, then we're going to get married. So with our wedding, Jesus said, Behold, I go to prepare a place for you in my Father's house. There are many mansions or dwelling places. And where I go, I'm going to come back. If it were not true, I would have told you. I'm going to come back for you. And he's speaking as the groom to the bride. I'm going to build your bridal chamber and I'm going to come back for you and get you. All right, hopefully I'm on the right one. In the Jewish wedding, an unexpected time after the, the preparation of the room is complete, the father commands the groom to go get his bride. Only the father knows the day or the hour of the groom's return for his bride. So therefore, the bride always has to be ready, even even sleeping in her bridal gown. So immediately in my mind comes up, are you ready? Are you sleeping in your bridal gown? With our wedding, Jesus said that no one but the Father knows the day or the hour of his return for us, his bride. All right, in the Jewish wedding, when the bridegroom does come, the groomsmen run ahead and they, they shout and they blow a trumpet and he is coming, he's coming, right? They're warning with uh, our wedding, when the bridegroom comes, it will be at the shout of the trumpet of God, and I emphasize the trumpet of God. The trumpets kind of get mixed up in some interpretations of when the rapture happens, but it's the trumpet of God, that Jesus is coming for his bride. In the Jewish wedding, the groom comes and takes his bride. The bride is placed, this is a really cool one, is placed in this chair and lifted up off the earth and carried in the air to her groom. Just like when Jesus comes, our bridegroom, we're going to be lifted up in the air, and we're going to read that verse later on, in the air, and taken to him, to meet him in the air. In fact, we're going to read that verse right now. John 14, 1 through 3 says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also. Where is Jesus? In heaven. Yeah, so we're going there. Uh, John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. All right, in the Jewish wedding, the groom takes his bride to the chamber, and they consummate the marriage, and they celebrate for a period of seven years. I, I just want to know. Not three. Seven, seven days. Oh, seven days. I'm sorry. But not, not three and a half days, not six days, seven days. And of course, we know that seven is the number of completion. We see here a picture of Daniel's 70th week, which we talked about in our last study. Um, and if you haven't seen it, go back and check it out. So it's a period, if you put the bride of Jesus anywhere else in the tribulation period for the seven-year tribulation, then you dismantle and destroy the typology that we see here. Like I said, if you go to three and a half years, you say that's when 
the rapture is going to happen, you mess up their typology. So Jesus is going to come and take us to a place that has been prepared for us. We're going to celebrate for a period of seven years, not seven days. And some said of this moment, while the world is tribulating, we're going to be celebrating. I kind of like that. Consummating our marriage to the Lamb. All right, almost there. Two more. In the Jewish wedding, this is after the seven days, there's this huge feast. Uh, that already makes me think about something else, but let me finish. In our wedding, it, it's a wedding feast of the Lamb. It's after seven-day year celebration and the consummation. We emerge from the bridal chamber, and there's a huge marriage feast of the Lamb, and we celebrate. And I just want a side note. Feast. Seven years. Food. And eternity. Okay, I'll keep going. And I'm pretty sure that we can eat all we want. We don't gain a pound. I'm positive. J.D. Frog noted this. This is why the post-tribulation is always a hard one, because if you rapture, hypothetically, just for the purpose of discussion, uh, that, it, that uh, it was a post-tribulation, then the wedding feast is going to be a drive-through snack lunch on a bungee cord. <laughs> All right. The sixth one in your outline. In the Jewish wedding, the new home of the bride was Jerusalem. Am I off again? Sorry. Uh, the new home for the bride was in Jerusalem, and it was the bridegroom who came to the bride to dwell with her. And in our wedding... From the new Jerusalem that Jesus, our bridegroom, will dwell with us forever and ever in the new Jerusalem for all eternity. Amen? All right. Now we're up. And one of the, uh, one example in scripture you could see of how this wedding plays out, this is well before uh, a Galilean wedding, um, but it's, uh, this, it's the uh, account of um, Abraham's son Isaac, uh, who sends a servant out, and um, whenever a servant is mentioned, uh, in the Old Testament, an unnamed servant. It's always a representation of the Holy Spirit. And, um, and in this typology of Genesis chapter 24, the, um, um, the Father, God the Father is represented by Abraham, and um, uh, the Son is represented by Isaac, and, um, and the Spirit is represented by the servant. And then that would mean um, Rebecca is represented by the bride. Um, but one thing that... It, pretty much plays out if you read Genesis chapter 24 it plays out um, almost exactly as the description uh, that Ken just said except um, when the servant brings uh, brings Rebecca back to uh, the father's house to Abraham's house um, Isaac has been there preparing a place for her the whole time but he actually goes out and it's very very descriptive and when Moses writes it he, he makes sure to write that Isaac goes out into the field to meet her and then brings her back to the father's house. Um, he doesn't wait for her to just come to the father's house. He goes out and meets her and then brings her back, meets her for the first time face to face. Very cool. All right. So the second P is uh, the promise. And, um, and the promise is uh, that we are going to be resurrected. And so, um, and this is, this is actually like our, our, our ultimate hope. Um, the definition of hope is that we will have our own resurrection. Um, and so, um, and the, the reason why we could have confidence of this hope is because Christ was the first fruits. Christ himself was, was resur resurrected. It's actually the, um, we have to believe that, you know, we have to believe in resurrection, other, otherwise we wouldn't be a Christian. And, um, and if Christ himself was able to be resurrected, then um, we could put all our trust and all our hope in the fact that we, too, will be resurrected. Uh, so Paul writes here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, this chapter is all about resurrection. Uh, verses 12 through 23, Paul writes, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead because in uh, the church in Corinth at the time there were so-called believers that that um, rejected the idea of a resurrection uh, but if there is no resurrection of the dead not even Christ has been raised and if Christ has not been raised then our preaching is in vain your faith is also in vain moreover we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God 
that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ, fallen asleep means um, died. Uh, so those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are, we are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits, which means there's more fruit to come. Of those who are asleep, for since by a man came death, by a man, which the man that came death was Adam, and by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, by each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ's at his coming. And his coming is a clear reference to um, every time that the rapture is, is mentioned, it's, it's called um, the coming of the Lord. And it's very different from the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is uh, the, God's judgment, the seven-year tribulation. Um, so Paul uses his coming, every time he uses um, his coming is um, in reference to the rapture, the resurrection. Um, so you can see that we, we the church, are promised to be resurrected with new immortal bodies, um, just as Christ was. And so uh, here's some more scriptures. Um, there's, there's many more scriptures than this that talk about the resurrection, but um, I've listed a few of them here. Uh, so John, um, John chapter 6, verses 39 to 40. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. And so there's Christ telling us that um, if we die and we're a, believe, we're a believer, then um, we will be resurrected on the last day. And that last day, again, is the fullness of the Gentiles, which we'll discuss um, when Paul writes in um, Romans chapter 11. Uh, John 6:44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. John 6:54. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So we're going to be raised up. Uh, John 11, 24 or 26. Martha, who has um, very good esch eschatology, said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day, speaking of Lazarus. Uh, and Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die because we have to be resurrected. Do you believe this? Luke 14, 14. I was just going to say, she only had the Old Testament, right? So the Old Testament teaches resurrection. You just got to know where to look. Yep. Um, and uh, so Luke 14, 14, but when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteousness. And that's in speaking not only are we going to be resurrected, we actually at this moment are also going to be receiving our, our reward, um, which is our judgment, um, but a judgment more for reward of the works that we've done rather than um, our sins. Uh, Romans 6, 5, For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Romans eight eleven. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And... Um, this verse right here, it's saying that it's actually the spirit that's in us that will deliver us up to Christ uh, at the time of the rapture, um, which is also part of the picture of the, the servant's role in the Jewish wedding. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.14, Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. 2 Corinthians 4.14, 
knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with, with you. And then Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, this is the author or the writer of Hebrews um, actually rebuking the believers for not understanding this concept. Um, so he says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of instruction about washing and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. So according to the writer of Hebrews, this is one of the, the fundamental doctrines about the resurrection of the dead. That might apply today too. Most of the church is not aware. And, uh, and then finally in 2 Corinthians um, uh, chapter 1 verses 9 and 10. Oh, I'll just read it. It says, Indeed, we have the sentence of death within ourselves, oh, yeah, I do. Sorry. so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us. He on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. So this is Paul actually giving us the definition of hope. We have set our hope on the fact that we will be resurrected. And so that, that is the promise. <laughs> and there's many more verses, but um, we are promised a resurrection. And, uh, and whether, we, whether we're um, dead at the time of the resurrection or we're alive at the time of the resurrection, we are promised um, uh, a new body. All right, so we've looked at the participants and we've looked at the promise. And number three on your outline, we're going to look at the purpose why the saints must be resurrected. If I press the right button, here we go. All right, so our first part is uh, the perishable cannot inherit imperishable. This is a pretty simple one. I, I get the easy ones. He has to read 87 verses. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, that's about as plain as it gets nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So pretty simple. Um, our natural bodies that we have now are simple bodies, and our simple bodies can't be in eternity. It's that simple. So we, the Apostle Paul talked about this is like our tent. We're going to get a new tent, but the new tent will be sinless, and then we can be in the presence of God, which we're going to talk about um, later. So we need a body without sin. All right, that was my part. And... The reason why we can't just be, why this body, the sin can't be removed from this body is because our, our body, our heart, everything in us, except the perfect spirit that dwells in us. Uh-oh. We lose you? Hopefully this mic works. Do I sound like Ken? <laughs> So we have a perfect spirit that lives, that dwells in us, and this perfect spirit, um, it's that constant battle with our flesh, and uh, our flesh and everything else about us except the spirit that is dwelling us as a believer um, is sinful. All have sinned, and all fall short of the glory of God, and so we have to have a new body um, to enter his presence, because um, as we see here, sin separates us from God. And sin cannot be in the presence of God without facing judgment. Um, Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is, is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then um, here's one example of how uh, sin cannot be in the presence of God. So um, on, when Moses was on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 33, um, Moses writes, But he said, you cannot see my, this is the Lord speaking to Moses, you cannot see my face, for no man could see me and live. Then the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock, and it will come about while my glory is passing by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So, um, the Lord is, is making a representation 
God, God is spirit in nature, so all everything that he's describing here is um, is a representation of himself. But um, what he's talking about seeing his face is he's talking about seeing his full glory, about being in the presence of his full glory. And he cannot, you cannot be in the presence of God in his full glory without him having to judge sin, um, because God is the perfect judge. And, and without judging sin in his presence, it would be um, injustice. Um, so then Isaiah writes in uh, chapter 59, verse 2, But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear. So um, it's our sins, uh, Isaiah describes it, our sin separates us from God, and that God cannot reveal his full glory to us until that sin is removed from us. Um, and then finally in Philippians 3, 20 and 21, Paul writes, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. By the exertion of the power that he has given to subject all things to himself. So that's Paul talking about how, um, in Philippians, how we're going to be transformed. Um, so now we're going to actually look at the process of how we're going to be transformed. So we've looked at the participants, the promise, the purpose, and then our fourth P now is the process. I just have to say, Um, so, this is a, this is like the best part of the whole thing, <laughs> the process. This is the main event. Uh, so, uh, we, we turn to First Thessalonians, which is the first letter that Paul actually wrote. Um, and he was only with the, the church uh, in, in, Thessalonica, in Thessalonica for about two weeks. And um, one of the things that he taught during these two weeks um, was all about the rapture, and all about the resurrection, and all about not having fear. And um, not and about not losing hope, and so um, Paul writes here um, in First Thessalonians uh, chapter four, verse thirteen through sixteen. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. And Paul's speaking about um, those believers that have died in this process, or, or um, have died um, prior to his return. Uh, so that you will not grieve as the rest who have no hope. So unbelievers, when uh, when an unbeliever um, loses another unbeliever, um, they mourn, they grieve, they have no hope, that so they'll never see them again. Um, but us, when uh, when a Christian, a fellow Christian dies, a brother or sister in Christ dies, we still have so much hope. You know, it's just a temporary loss for us. We'll see them again, and um, we have that hope, our hope that we'll be resurrected and we'll uh, be reunited uh, with other believers. Um, and so, uh, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you, not yet, by the word of the Lord, that we, will, that we who are alive and remain Hang on, did I mess up? Oh yeah, okay. For the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So this is, the, um, this is when it happens. This is, at, at some point um, in history, this event is going to happen. And Paul writes it right here. It's going to happen just like this. And there's always a remnant of believers all the time. So we cannot wait until all the believers are dead. There's going to be many dead believers throughout history. Um, but uh, since God always, always keeps a remnant of believers alive at all times, there's always going to be believers that are alive at the time that this event happens. Um, so here Paul is talking that um, when the trumpet sounds at the trumpet call of God, um, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. So that's that's the first step one. So um, uh, believers that have died, they'll they'll be instantly resurrect, 
is instantly resurrected, transformed in the twinkling of an eye, twinkling of an eye, and um, and so that that's step one. And notice how it says, uh, "The Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel." And then you compare that to um, John chapter fourteen, verses one through three. Um, first, Paul writes, "Do not grieve as those who have no hope." Um, Jesus says. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me also. Um, and then he says that he'll go prepare a place for us, and I will come again to receive you to myself. So he's, the Lord is descending to receive us to himself, himself at this point. We're going to talk a little bit about later about the different viewpoints about the rapture, but I mean, if this isn't pretty clear that there is a rapture, I, I don't know what those people do with these verses, right? I, I don't know how they justify what they're talking about, but it, it's pretty clear. And a, a second note would be that um, this is the church. It's not the Old Testament saints. It's the saints that have died since Jesus died and rose again. In Christ. So, in, Christ. in Christ. Right. Okay, so the dead in Christ will rise first, and now we're going to look at those who are alive. And that hopefully that's us and remain. All right, so the rest of First Thessalonians. And another thing that just comes to my mind here is the people that say that, um, do you remember uh, Pastor Lars mentioned a book during our, our thing? With, uh, somebody had written a book and given it to him uh, talking about the rapture was a new teaching by Darby about 100 years ago. And right here, well, actually, Paul taught it 2,500 years ago or 2,000 years ago, right? I just want to note that as like, well, Paul taught it first. And in addition, I, I learned some more about Darby. So they, they said that Darby, the people that oppose um, the rapture, and that it just is a new teaching, they said that Darby learned it from uh, a 15-year-old girl that had a vision and explained it and on and on and on. Well, interesting enough, Darby, I learned, he translated the Old and New Testament in three different languages and the New Testament in two different languages and was a part of planning 1,500 churches. So I don't think he was a guy that was listening to somebody with a vision, right? I mean, he was pretty sound. Uh, he would definitely be a scholar in our eyes today. But anyway, so we'll go on. Now the good part. Hopefully it, it's us. Verse uh, 17. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up, that's underlined, we're going to talk about that in a moment, together with them in the clouds. Notice, so we're going to get caught up with them, the ones that he just raised from the dead, to meet the Lord in the air. So, so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And there's a lot we can say about this, but a couple of things to jump out. First off, uh, being caught up together, that's the word that's translated in uh, Latin, rapture, rapturos. We get the, the translation of rapture. They say, rapture's not in the, in the Bible. You know? But the second thing I want to notice, because a lot of people that don't believe in the rapture think it's the second coming. And if you notice right here, the second coming, Jesus comes to earth, and in the rapture, he comes to the air and takes us with him. Right? So it's pretty clear on this verse. So a, a couple of things. First off, um, people say that Rapture's not in the Bible. Um, yes and no. It depends on what Bible you have. It's not in the English Bible. Um, but lots of words aren't in the Bible what the Bible teaches them. Example, Trinity is not in the Bible, but the Trinity is clearly taught. The word Bible is not in the Bible. But do we have a Bible? And a, a millennium. Millennium is not in the Bible, but it says a thousand years. So it's because it doesn't use the exact word, it doesn't mean that it's not taught. Um, the specific word rapture comes from the English translation, um, I'm sorry, the Latin translation, and others that include it are Italian and the Romanian translations use the word rapture. Um, the Greek word, I think I have it on here. Oh. All right, maybe I don't have it in the right spot. I guess I don't. I had harpazo on there, but... Um, the word in the Greek is harpazo. It means to openly, forcefully be taken up or openly and suddenly caught away. Let's see, I think that's actually, that is, yeah. That's where we got our, that's where we get our uh, English word harpoon. Yeah. Harpoon from, harpazo. Looks like it's working right now for temporarily. Um, 
So rapture could be, uh, the word rapture itself, it's almost like a nickname for this event. Um, it's not in the Bible, uh, the actual word, unless you have a Latin Bible. And I believe Gabriel said rapturo is in the Spanish Bible, right? Yeah. Um, we, we, but, we do give words that come meanings for things. Exactly. That kind of confuses people. Rapture would be one of those. So, uh, yeah, so we could look at... Um, as this event, we don't have to call it the rapture, we could call it the resurrection of the saints, or we could call it um, our hope. Uh, either one of those work, either one of those work, but um, since it's commonplace to call it the rapture, we're, we're gonna continue to call it the rapture, or the rapture of the church. Um, so now we're gonna look how we are gonna be changed. Um, so like what happens, how do we lose our sinful body? What happens to our sinful body? Paul writes, in um, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, verses 50 to 57. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. This is actually the second mystery that, that um, we're talking about tonight. The first one was within reference to Christ uh, and the church, um, Christ being the bridegroom of the church. Uh, so now this one is a mystery. Um, meaning it's the first time that it's explained. Uh, it, there's, there's pictures of it in the Old Testament, uh, many, many pictures of this in the Old Testament, but it's never been directly explained. So now Paul is explaining um, this event of the resurrection. Um, so, behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, which means we will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So Paul, Paul's writing here that in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, it, and the word for that is um, atmos, which is the, the most indivisible amount of time. Um, the word in Greek is atmos. Uh, so it's instantaneous. Uh, the twinkling of eye, the, the speed of the twinkling of an eye has been um, described as the time it takes for light to tra travel from your cornea to your um, to the back of your eye, to the optic nerve, which is the speed of light is, is instant. So one, one day we'll just, if, if we're the lucky generation, if we're lucky enough to be alive and the ones that are alive and remain when this happens, we'll just be, in an instant, we'll hear a trumpet and a call of God, and um, and instantly we'll we'll blink, and we'll be in the clouds. We're not gonna we're not gonna raise up or anything. We'll just in an instant um, we'll have an immortal body, and we'll be in the clouds with Jesus. And I almost think of it as like I saw there's a there's a video um, on the internet that was going around a few years ago. There's a there was a I think it was a, a pole vaulter in the Olympics. Um, and he was running down, uh, running down the, the lane to do his pole vault. And like right in the middle of his run, he heard the, the American National Anthem play. And he just dropped the, the pole and um, was, looked around for the flag and found it. And, um, and stood and saluted the flag during the National Anthem. And so that when this happens, if we're alive and, um, and we hear this trumpet, Nothing on earth is going to matter. Nothing else, whatever we're doing, nothing is going to matter. We're going to be like this Olympian who just dropped everything, um, and our life will be instantly changed. Uh, we'll have immortality, and we will not return to this earth until we return again with Christ. And um, it'll, be a, it'll be a completely different world at that point when we do return. Um, but that's, a, that's kind of the analogy that comes to mind when I when I read that verse. You know, some people that are kind of against the rapture, you know, they talk about it, it's like escapism. I just want to say, 
Amen. I mean, think about what we've been through the last couple of years. Okay, it's only getting worse, right? It's going to get worse, in my opinion. And we're, you know what? If I get to escape the wrath of God, I'm a pretty happy guy. You know, <laughs> why do I want to go through all that stuff if He's chosen me to, to go like that? I'm, I'm just game for it. Anyway, so we're just, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, we really want to encourage you guys about this because, uh, again, the verses in the Bible over and over again talk about believers that we are citizens of heaven, not citizens of this world. In fact, we're called in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I think it is, that we're ambassadors, right? We're, we represent another place, and we're temporarily in a foreign land. We're ambassadors. In fact, Cheryl shared about how in, in war, before the big battle comes, the ambassadors get taken out, right? So we're here temporarily to do what God wants us to do with the expectation that any moment he's going to take us away. So a question arises in your mind, what are you going to be doing when the rapture happens? Well, you don't know when it's going to happen. I can remember several years ago, I, I used to live in uh, um, Beaumont, California, and I was working in uh, Temecula, and I was driving back. Um, I was actually going to church in Temecula, and I was driving back, and I was in the middle of nowhere. There's this big intersection, and it turned red, and there was cars going this way, and I just that quick, I looked in my mirror, and this is like 11 o'clock in the morning, and some guy who had been partying all night long goes into the other lane to try to get through the intersection, and it happened this quick. I saw him in my mirror. He went around me, and I'm in the left-hand turn lane, and he tries to go back, and he didn't hit any cross traffic, but he hit somebody in a motorhome that was turning left, right? And he moved the motorhome 20 feet. It happened that quick. Bam! He was dead. And the first thing that came to my mind was that Paul said, I finished the race strong. Because we don't know when it's going to happen. We don't know when the rapture is going to happen. But the question is, are we finishing the race strong? Which means you have to be doing it continuously, right? Being obedient, submitting, confessing your sin when you fall short, right? So we will be about God's business. Because what do you want to be doing when he comes for us? I mean, don't you want to be living the life that glorifies him? And then one thing I want to add about this is that um, Paul and, and the other apostles that wrote about the rapture, they wrote this um, 2,000 years ago almost, expecting that the rapture was going to happen in their day. And um, here we are 2,000 years later, and uh, we're that much closer. And in fact, we could see on the horizon um, what the Bible describes this seven-year tribulation is going to be like. We could see everything, all the events lining up for this to take place. And so if that's about to happen, then how much closer is the rapture? It's like the analogy when you start to see Christmas decorations in the stores, you know that Thanksgiving is near. So if, we're, if, if the <laughs> tribulation is, is Christmas, you know, then, it, then uh, the rapture would be Thanksgiving. You know, we're, we're getting so, so close. And next week we're going to look at and see exactly how close we are um, to the tribulation period, to God's judgment, um, which means that it's even closer to uh, the rapture of the church. Amen. Amen. Okay. Heavenly Father, we just we just thank you, Lord, just for this message of hope that you've given us. Lord, without this hope, um, we would just be living in fear. We would be living in fear, Lord, that uh, we would have to go through this tribulation, that we would have to endure this. And, um, and with everything that we see in the world, um, we just thank you, Lord, that we could have faith and um, confidence that you will resurrect us and you will save us from your wrath that's going to be poured out. Everywhere, every example in scripture, before you pronounce your own judgment on unbelievers, you've always rescued your saints every single time. And we are not an exception to that. Uh, we will be rescued, Lord, before your judgment. And um, we just thank you, Lord, just for our salvation. And we lift you up and we glorify you. And we just want you to come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Side note, 7.59. This is a sign. <laughs> I want a sign. Wow. Can we just go right into questions? Yeah, we can yeah so um, we could take some questions if you guys want. Uh, so we, we this week we, we just wanted to get uh, through, um, we, we could do questions on, on anything rapture related, but um, our focus this week was to, to try to get through um, uh, the four P's, basically, the participants, the, um, the process, um, and the promise. the promise, 
Yeah, and so uh, uh, we wanted to get through that, and then we wanted to get to the, like describing what actually the rapture is. Um, and then next week we're going to get to the signs of um, how we know we're getting close to the tribulation. Um, and then on the third week, um, we are going to go into um, some more of Paul's writing that, and um, some writing um, from Matthew and all of the discourse that actually describe when exactly this is going to happen. Um, we don't know the exact date, obviously, but um, we know where on the prophetic timeline the rapture occurs uh, based on scripture. And then we're going to... Um, and then we're going to go into some of the other views of the rapture, like post-tribulation, mid-tribulation, partial, partial rapture, pre-wrath, um, and uh, no rapture. And we're going to explain like where where these viewpoints come from and what Scripture has to say about it, um, and how the pre-tribulation view is really the only view that offers us any hope. And if if the rapture is the definition of rapture is hope, then um, common sense tells us that, that 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 clearly is the only option is the pre-tribulation. Uh, so we'll take some questions if you guys have any. I just want to note that all the other versions don't have how this verse ends. Therefore, comfort one another in its words. You know what? You only got to go through half of the tribulation. A third of the world's going to die. But hey, be comforted by this. Or if it's at the end, you know, you got to get beat up, squashed down, turned around, but, but be comforted by this. And how often does the bride do that before she gets married? Ask away. Uh, question. Uh, you said uh, we're going to be seen, modified. What does it, does it really go into detail of what modifications, what other changes that God has to make for us to, once we die? It says, it says something about the sin is going to change it. You know, for him to, that he's going to change for us, you know, to be a testament to the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Does it go into detail what those changes are? Well, we'll, we'll be getting, um, the transformation is that we'll be getting a glorified body, which means our body will be sinless. And uh, what that looks like, we don't really know. Um, we don't know if we're going to look the same or, or not. Um, one thing that comes to mind is um, when uh, Peter uh, described Moses and Elijah on the Mount uh, or the Transfiguration. He knew who they were, who they were um, and he described Jesus um, the description of Jesus in that was uh, the same description that Revelation gives of Jesus returning um, uh, with a face of shining like the sun and um, white robe and his glory and all that. Um, but as for Moses and Elijah, well, actually they didn't, they don't even have the resurrected bodies at that point, so it was just a representation of what they're going to look like. But in um, Revelation chapter 4, when it um, John writes about uh, the 24 elders that are in the throne room. Those 24 elders are a representation of the church, and uh, they look like people, and, um, but they're, they're all wearing white robes, which means um, white robes is a picture of salvation, and they're wearing crowns, which means they've received their rewards at that point. Um, so um, as far as what we'll look like, I think we're going to look like people, um, and we're also going to uh, when we return um, with Christ, we're going to be on earth for the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And um, faith comes by hearing by the word of God and not by seeing. So I don't think we're going to look much different than any other people. Um, if we had like, you know, we were Superman or had like ultra glorified bodies of whatever that looks like, then um, other unbelievers, because we know there's going to be many unbelievers in the millennial kingdom, um, they would, their faith would come by seeing us as being supernatural of some sort. But it, so I think, um, in my opinion, that we're going to look just like regular people, but just not have any sin. And, and we won't be aged, whatever that is. You know, before the flood, people lived like 800, 900, 1,000 years old. When you read about Moses and, uh, you know, he was... 80 years old when this happened? Well, he wasn't a crinkly old guy. He was 80 years by their time, right? So I think that, this is just my opinion, is because the, the priest would become a priest, or the prophets normally, it was at the age of 33. So I think we're going to be like young, mature adults, whatever that looks like, you know? But that's just my opinion. I, I, don't, I think that... We'll just be made immortal. Right. So Paul says, we'll be made imperishable. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, people, 
Okay. If people t talk about, you know, pray for me, right? Pray for my body, pray for this. Yeah. Well, the ultimate healing will be our new bodies, right? We'll be healed. We'll be perfectly how God intended us to be, like it was in the beginning, some form of it. Some more questions? Come on, you got to have some out there. I didn't have a question, but I just wanted to add what you said at the end. Um, for us that are here, think about it. This is our best witnessing tool that we could possibly have right now, especially the way the world is going. People are fearful, and we have joy if we have joy, and they say, well, how come you're so excited? Because I'm not going to be here, but we have the rapture, and it gives you an opening to share the gospel with people. Well, it's just the perfect time. We know where we're going.
the world falling apart, that we're going to have to endure certain things. But again, going back to our hope, it doesn't really matter how much we have to endure, because we know this is, number one, if God wants us to endure things, it's for his glory to be witnesses to the people that aren't going yet, right? That last person that's going to get saved, you know? And one more thing to add to this is, we could trust this. God has told us this is going to happen. And that is how you validate the word of God, is through prophecy. God tells us the future before it happens with 100% accuracy. And 30% of the Bible is actually about events yet to come. Is, um, or, I'm sorry, 30% of the Bible is prophecy, and half of that, so 15%, is about events yet to come, and the rapture is one of them. And um, that's why Christianity and faith in Christ, um, based on, on the Word of God, that's how we know that this is the ultimate authority, is because um, it tells us the future in advance. And there's no other document, no other religion, nobody else can make that claim uh, that um, they could tell us the future in advance. And of all the other religions on the world, um, no, no other uh, person or figure of that religion, um, not Muhammad, not Buddha, um, not Joseph Smith, um, just the Mormon guy, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, none of them uh, were resurrected. You know, none of them, only Christ was able to overcome death. You know, everyone else is dead. And so that's how we could put our faith that this event will happen, just as it says. Okay. You, know, you know, one will just add to that. It is, because this is a big one on my heart, what he just shared, is our authority is scripture. So people, a lot of people take it lightly. The, the, the Bible promises at the end that there's going to be an apostate church, which I believe is already happening. Yeah. And, and there, there are known Christian pastors that used to really preach great stuff, and now they're discounting parts of the Bible, including and mostly the Old Testament. Like it doesn't matter, and it does matter because the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, right? The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Is It's all part of the picture. All those typologies are very, very important. So people, some pastors are saying, well, we don't even need to read the Old Testament. Oh, yeah, you do, because it's God's authority to guide us. And so when I share, like, with people at work, um, one guy that I'm sharing with is he's really a new agent. He doesn't know he is, but he brings up, he thinks he's going to be reincarnated. And I just ask him the question, well, how do you know? What, what's your proof? Well, he has no proof. And then he did turn me on to a Netflix show that kind of talked about that kind of stuff. He said, hey, I watched number three or whatever it was, and it was like, well, people saw a light or they could tell about somebody's past, somebody that was long since dead. How could they know about somebody's past? That must have been who they used to be. And I go, so some person's going to tell you that. But here, we've got the Bible where God tells the future before it happens. You know. So I always turn to that to go, okay, you know what? You may not believe me today, but if I disappear, or if this happens, or if that happens, you know, then, then you'll know, right? Okay. Do you have another question? So unbelievers do face eternal judgment. Um, they will be separated from God eternally, and they'll, um, without eternity, uh, which is a very long time, in the lake of fire. And um, right now, believers that have died, they're in a place called Sheol, which is like a holding tank until they ultimately end up in the lake of fire. Um, but they're separated from God. Um, God's judgment, which is also known as God's wrath, um, it's, you know, there's been several judgments um, from God in the Bible, you know, there's there was the flood, um, there's Sodom and Gomorrah, um, there's the judgment against uh, um, Egypt when they all drowned in the Red Sea, but there's a final judgment of God, God coming on this world, and that is um, um, the seven-year tribulation, which is described um, in detail in the book of Revelation, and also it's described in um, bits and pieces all throughout the Old Testament prophets, but um, the full description of it is... Uh, uh, chapters 6 through 16 in, uh, in Revelation. You know, the best way I heard it put is, uh, you know, eternal judgment is people getting exactly what they wanted. They, they wanted nothing to do with God. They want nothing to do with them, and that's what they're going to get. But they don't realize how terrible that is because the Bible clearly teaches that all good things come from God, even to the lost. 
You know, the rain rains on the saved and the unsaved, but what they, what they don't realize is all those good things will be gone, right? Because God's blessing will be um, taken from them, and they're going to be in eternal darkness forever. Yes? I'm, I'm hoping. First of all, that in the last days, 
mockers will come with their mocking following their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the father fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes our notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. So they're actually fulfilling prophecy by saying that. And that when we, next week when we look at um, how do we know we're getting close, um, one thing that Jesus says is for the coming of the Son of Man would be just like the days of Noah. It's going to be, you know, he says, um, and then you give an example, people are buying and selling and giving in marriage and this and that, which means it's going to be life as normal. And it's going to be an un unexpected event. But the one thing that we have that has never happened before is right now Israel and the church are existing at the same time. And that right there should have everybody's attention. Never has ha this happened ever in history since 70 AD. And the fact that Israel <laughs> is back in their land in unbelief is a direct prophecy that we could see happen today, Ezekiel 36. Um, and, and so everything else that's happened um, in the past um, like, why wasn't Hitler the Antichrist? And, and why, why didn't ten kings arise out of that and, and everything? It's because um, Israel is not yet a nation. That's how we know we're so close now. And, and I think, too, when it comes to, like, evil and it getting worse, so this is what we've experienced in the last two years, for America especially, but for the world, it's gotten a lot worse. But, man, when we talk about what the tribulation period says, it's going to be way worse. I mean, literally, people are going to want to die, and they can't die, right? Um, a third of the population is going to die. That's worse than anything that's ever happened before, right? So it is actually going to get really, really, really bad. It's just hard for us to imagine how bad that is, but we're actually getting a little taste about when, when the Antichrist comes, about what he's going to do to manipulate people to do his bidding, and, you know, I think, I think those, the people that are skeptics that are aware of that may see that different when they're living under the ultimate tyranny. Just think of a planet of chihuahuas. And, and 
God becomes a chihuahua, and then he becomes a glorified chihuahua, but he's still in the chihuahua body. That is pretty crazy thought. John Corson, he has lots of food. He's in a body right now. <laughs> 